1. My cousin was staying with me one weekend, and we decided to go out for brunch on Sunday before she left. This was the type of family-run diner that had newspapers and slots on the wall beside the table. I had left my phone at home, so I grabbed the weekend edition of my town's paper while we waited for our food. I flipped through the obituaries to find an entry of one of my high school teachers. I was shocked initially due to how young she was. She was maybe in her early fifties, so I thought it must have been an accident or an illness. The obituary was vague, but nonetheless accounted her death and date, which was earlier that week. So naturally, when I got home, I went on Facebook and looked up the teacher's Facebook to read the inevitable condolences and well wishes. But there was nothing. We weren't friends on Facebook or anything, but her account wasn't private. There didn't seem to be any trace of anything that would suggest she was dead. Then I noticed she had shared some cooking video from a day that was after the day she apparently died in the obituary. So then I thought, oh, this must be a student prank, right? I mean, it was around the end of the school year and this could totally have been an over-the-top senior prank or something, right? So I started messaging people like, hey, did you hear so-and-so died? Everyone I asked said stuff like, no, I didn't hear anything like that. I even asked kids who were still in high school, the same one I went to. And even they had no idea what I was talking about. So then I got creeped out. So if it wasn't a prank, and if she's not really dead, then why the fuck did that obituary read that she died? I looked online on the newspaper's website, but I couldn't find the one I read in the paper at the diner. I would have went back to that restaurant to try to find the paper, but I'm sure they would have threw it out by the time I thought to look. I didn't investigate any further. She was the sweetest lady, and was pretty well liked and respected by the students and other staff members, as she'd been at that school most of her career. I just can't see anyone pulling a prank on her like that. But even if they did, which is possible, why am I the only one who seemed to have seen it? I tried sending the teacher a friend request so I can ask her about it, but her friend list is a relatively small group of mostly family and friends, and no students. Must be the type who doesn't add students on social media, so I doubt she'll add me back. I could try contacting the newspaper, but if it wasn't online then it must have got pulled. If it existed at all. In that case it was a prank, but by who? The one thing I noticed in the obituary that makes it all the more confusing is that the obituary accurately lists the remembered by, the close family and friends right down to her grandchildren. If it was a prank, it would have had to have been by someone who really did their research, or someone who really knew the family, the latter being creepy as hell. I may do some further research in the future, maybe try to find an archived copy of that paper, until then, I have no answers. I'm pretty skeptical and would like to think it was just a prank. And if it was a prank, they did a hell of a damn good job covering it up. Because as far as I know, I'm still the only one who thought she died. 2. One day I was hanging out with my cousin doing our usual stuff like playing video games and yelling at each other. My aunt comes in and wants us to go with her to pick up her prescription. So on the way there, everything's normal, just listening to music and talking to each other, normal family stuff. We grab the prescription through a drive through in, I think, CVS or something. On our way back is when it gets weird. We are driving back home and after a few red lights, I look out the window and up in the sky is what looks like Jupiter, the planet. Not way off in the distance either, like right fucking next to us. Like if we took a rocket to it, it would probably take one minute to get there. I ask my aunt what that is, and she, being not even phased by the situation, says something to the extent of, oh, that's... The name escapes me every time. I'm staring at it through the car window, amazed but very calm, as if it's just normal. And now I'm of age to finally understand, but... Now when I look back at the memory, I'm scared, confused, amazed, excited. Then it stops, it just goes blank. That's where my memory ends. 
Right after that, I'm sitting in my cousin's house as if I just zoned out. I ask him what happened, and he has no clue what I'm talking about. And I explain to him what happened, and he calls me crazy. So I just drop it. Ever since then, this memory has stuck with me. I have no clue if I'm alone in this, or if there are others, but I haven't said a word to anyone about this since that day. And my cousin and aunt, as far as I know, have since forgotten the whole ordeal. I'm now 20, and I've had this memory for a very long time. I had to have been maybe 10 or 11 at the time. As a kid, and even now, I've been obsessed with all things space. And I've been talking about it a lot lately. I've never thought of who I could tell or where I could share it until now. I doubt it's actually a Mandela or anything, but it stuck with me for so long that it's got to be something. I often find myself feeling out of place around people. Like me being who I am and my personality is more advanced than human capabilities. It sounds stupid, but it's true. Sometimes, without even thinking, I'll be texting my friends telling them that I want to go home while laying down in my bed. At that point, I make up something saying that I'm at, like, McDonald's or something, so I don't sound weird. Like I said, I don't know if I'm alone, but please feel free to comment what you think. If you share this memory or feeling with me, or if you just think it's a false memory. 3. I woke up one evening. We kept a third shift schedule because we work thirds, and I wasn't sure if my wife was awake or not. I was facing away from her, so I reached my hand back, felt her leg, and knew she was in bed. I gave it a little squeeze to see if she was awake, and she didn't move. So I got out of bed quietly, felt her shift a bit as I did, and then went to the bathroom to brush my teeth. I then walked past the bedroom to get to the living room, glanced in, and saw a wife-sized lump under the covers. I figured I'd let her sleep, so I continued on to the living room. She was on the couch, wide awake, halfway through a cup of coffee searching around on YouTube. There is no way she got out of bed and into the living room from when I saw her in the hallway. The hallway was small. She would have had to have physically moved me in the hallway to get around me. My morning bathroom routine takes maybe five minutes tops. She had clearly been awake for at least 45, and she had claimed to have been awake for over an hour. I doubled back to the bedroom and looked in the bed, and the covers were thrown off of her side, like she usually does when she gets up. There was no way I'd seen her lying in the bed. I flipped the light on, and the scene stayed the same, covers thrown off. I still can't make any sense of this. Any ideas? Again, it's pretty simple stuff, but it freaked me out. 4. Eight years ago, I was living in a two-bedroom apartment by myself with two cats. I had a girlfriend, who I will name Elsa for this story, who lived 45 minutes away, on her college campus. Most weekends, she would drive into town and stay at my place until she had class again on Monday. We did regular things, as we didn't get to see much of each other. We liked to spend time alone together, watching movies, playing games, or the like. Please keep in mind that neither of us were drug or alcohol users, as I have a good job I can't risk losing, and she just simply never cared for intoxicants. Nor were either of us on any medication. So here's the scene. It's Saturday night, 11pm. Elsa and I are sitting on the couch watching a movie. I can't remember which. We are dressed, sober and alert, as we slept in that morning and had plenty of sleep. We are chatting, laughing, talking. The TV is illuminating our immediate area, and I kept the light on in the kitchen to provide some ambient light for the living room as well. My cats are asleep in their favorite chair. All is well. Everybody is safe and comfortable. Suddenly, without any kind of warning or inkling, the jump, as I have come to call it, happened. You know when you're watching dialogue in a movie and they're using two cameras to film? 
when they switch from camera to camera to capture the one speaking. It is seamless, with no clipping, interruption, fading or transition effects. It was that sudden. We were having a good time together in the living room when in an instant I found myself sitting on the foot of my bed, clothes removed in the dark. For about one half of a second, a million thoughts entered my mind. Had something fallen off the wall and hit my head? Did I have a seizure? Was I dreaming the whole time? Where is Elsa? Then the scary part. I turn to my right, and Elsa is also sitting on the foot of the bed next to me, clothes removed. Her eyes are the size of golf balls and she's trembling. I realize I am as well. I try to speak and ask her if something happened, but I'm so frightened I only stutter. After looking around the room and realizing we were alive, she managed to ask me what happened. I didn't want to answer, in case it was just me, and I didn't want to come off as nuts. I just looked at her. After a pause, she started asking me again if I had turned off the lights or removed our clothes or if I knew what was going on. I didn't. Neither of us had experienced grogginess or confusion before the event. Furthermore, we didn't experience any sensations other than fear and confusion after it. No aches or pains, no bumps, bruises or cuts. I reached for my phone to call my mom and see if a doctor would be appropriate. I noticed that it's not 11pm anymore, now it's 3am. In that sudden instant, that instantaneous change of scene, four hours had passed. Everything in the house had been turned off, and we had been stripped. We went to the ER as my mom's fear was a gas leak. No signs of toxins or injury were found on either of us. Elsa made an appointment for a CAT scan, which also came back as expected. I explored possibilities like a gas leak, poisoned consumer goods like our soda or fast food, neurological malfunctions, and more. But the one thing that always bothered me was the fact that Elsa and I lost and acquired the time at the exact same instance, four hours apart. Neither of us witnessed anything that the other didn't, and there were no lingering effects. For weeks I kept bringing it up with her, just hoping one of us would remember something. I browsed forums from all types of sites searching for answers. Every time I brought it up, Elsa would get scared at the memory and beg me to just let it go. I couldn't. I'm no writer, so I'm sure I left some things out that would have been helpful in understanding the magnitude and surrealism of this event and how it affected Elsa and I. Please, if you've read this much and you have a question, clarification, or even a theory, I've been waiting eight years to hear it. Somebody, tell me what happened to me. Edit. After a lot of people pushed for the title of the movie Elsa and I were watching, I went on a search. I went to IMDb and looked at screenshots of chick flicks from 2008 to 2009. That's not to say I'm certain that's when the movie in question came out, but it was my best ballpark. The only movie that struck me was Revolutionary Road. This is because I seem to remember loving Leonardo's hair in this movie, based on the screenshots I saw. Again, this is not to say it is the movie that I loved his hair in, but it's the best I've found so far. 5. In April this year, I won an antique table in an auction. My then-boyfriend Dan and I drove to Brisbane to pick it up. Dan's not a fan of antiques, but seemed excited for the adventure. Brisbane is about 300 kilometers from where I live, a day trip. We left after lunch and were planning to pick up the table, have dinner at a pub and drive home that night. I was tired from work and feeling a bit off. Dan was quiet and got quieter and quieter as we approached Brisbane. I thought he was tired too. So we picked up the table and went to dinner. As we approached the pub, a girl standing out front waves at Dan. Dan waves back. She clearly recognizes both of us, greets us like she knows both of us. I have no clue who she is and say so, 
but she ignores me when I say as much. The girl, Carla something, ate dinner with us. I wasn't comfortable, but Dan was so happy to see her, animated. All through the meal, I had an awful gut feeling. Dan broke up with me right after dinner. He was leaving me for Carla, who, he told me, he'd met online months ago. Generously, he said he'd dropped the table at my parents. Then he went off with Carla. I had no lift home and nowhere to stay. It's after midnight, and I'm a long way from home. I needed money, called everyone I know. Only a few answered, and they were broke. I couldn't raise my parents, who were probably in bed by then. So what to do? I was clearly gonna be stuck overnight, at least. I decided to go and sit in King George Square and think. It felt like a safe place to go as it's a large open space. I can see anyone coming at me. I plunked myself down in front of the pig and whistle. It's closed, of course. Two gangster-looking Asian guys are wandering around when I arrive. They're checking the locks, shaking the security gates of the various kiosks. I pretend not to notice. Around this time, stomach cramps hit me like a brick. I became shivery and increasingly nauseated. Started to sweat even though it was cool that night, and I was only wearing summer clothes at the time. I wonder whether my dinner was off. From the other side of the square, a man in a black hoodie stared at me for a good ten minutes. He kept moving seat to seat to get a better look. I started to panic a bit. A sudden wave of nausea hits and I double over, retching. When I straighten up, an old man and two young men are approaching. They are dressed like Mormons, white shirts, dark ties, and pants. They wear ID name tag thingies clipped to their shirt pockets. Then I'm doubled over again, throwing up. I come up again, and the old man has sat down beside me. You've been drinking, love. He has an Irish accent. The tag on his shirt says Father O'Craig. St. Bodine's Homeless Project. I shake my head, gag again, but manage to suppress it. Not tonight. Between episodes of vomiting, I explain my situation and Father O'Craig offers me a bed at the homeless mission. I feel strange about going with them, but I'm too ill to be alone and they seem okay. The two younger men help me to the van because I can hardly straighten up by then. There's a few other women in the van already there. That made me feel safer. A small group are also clearly waiting to see the father. They greet him by name, big smiles, hugs. This put me a little more at ease. We drive to a cathedral, it's only a few blocks. In the grounds, there's this little painted weatherboard church hall. It's mint green with banana-colored trim. I remember thinking how funny the dinky little wood building looked, right next to the giant stone monster, and how fifties it looked. The younger men stamped my hand on arrival. Apparently this means you've been accepted for the night. They show me to a bed in a group dormitory. I'm so exhausted by then, I fall straight to sleep. Next morning I'm given breakfast. I call my dad and he transfers some money into my account. Father O'Craig drives me to Roma Street Station and I take a train home. A week later I win $200 on a scratchy. I decided to donate $50 to St. Bodine's. I google it, but can't find anything, even with the address. I figure I got the name wrong. A couple of weeks ago, my mum and I were in Brisbane. I thought I'd drop in and thank Father O'Craig for his help. We walked to the cathedral. Where I remembered St. Bodine's being, I find a car park, some trees, and an older building instead. It looks like it's been that way for a long while, too. Later in the day, my mother and I were in Queen Street Mall, and we encountered a pair of bike cops. We asked them where St. Bodine's is. The cop we directed the question at didn't know, but his mate did. It's right next door to St. Stephen's Cathedral. Hey everyone, Hell Freezer here. And thank you very much for listening to 5 True Glitch in the Matrix Stories, number 38. Big thanks to everybody for the massive and wonderful response I got in searching for glitch stories this week. 
I was hoping to get uh, about two weeks worth because I'm trying to I'm trying to carve out a week off is what I'm trying to do. I believe I mentioned that earlier in, in the week. And I'm so grateful to everybody because I, ju- I got more stories than I needed, which is awesome. So big thanks to everybody for letting me use their stories. Can I just say, that boyfriend in that last story there, disgusting behaviour, truly disgusting behaviour. It sounds like he actually brought her there just so he could break up with her in front of his new girlfriend. Shameful. Right, anyway, I think I'll head off for now. So until next time, thank you very much for listening and take very good care of yourselves.